So I had a misunderstanding. So I prepared a lecture. I, I initially was told I would get some cases and then I'd answer them. And then um, I got an email saying, where are your slides? And so I was like, oh, okay, I guess I got to do a talk. So what I'll do is I, I think that this addresses, um, and you guys, you don't see my presenter view, right? You see my actual slides. Okay. And, and I think that we'll address those questions. I, I, I did a screenshot of them so I can uh, bring them back up and make sure that I've covered all the, but I think that if I put it in context of sort of what's going on and um, I, I'll probably go through the, some of these slides pretty quickly because I don't, I don't want to go over time, but um, I think that the, that the slides will address a lot of the questions that you have and I can at least then frame it in, in some of the things that I think would be sort of good practice and, and where the nephrologist is involved. Um, so I think you guys know why you care about kidney disease. And, and I think you're all seeing an increased prevalence of chronic kidney disease. I'll show you an illustration of that. Um, so if I keep looking that way, it's because my picture's there. It's like this weird thing on Zoom, right? But I'll try, actually, no, let me, let me, let me just do this. I'm gonna duplicate it that way. Sorry, this way I feel like you guys are seeing me. Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, where was I? So we, we know that we're seeing more chronic kidney disease. Um, kidney function import, dysfunction importantly is an independent predictor of mortality. So the, these, the, the patients that we care for, um, you know, are, are, have had much higher risk of mortality if they have kidney dysfunction, even more than having, for example, a high cholesterol. You all know it's asymptomatic. So we have to really just be monitoring and that sort of will address the, this question of, you know, what should we be looking at in our patients and hope we'll discuss some of that. Obviously the implication of drug and drugs and toxicity. Um, and then obviously we wanna pick up disease and, and send the patients to a nephrologist when appropriate. And I don't really have a, a slides to address when should you send someone urgently to nephrology. Um, but I think that criteria for, for doing such would be really any um, rapid rising creatinine would, would clearly be a reason to be seen and really probably the only real emergent situation, right? If someone's got a, a new proteinuria and, and their kidney function is stable, I don't think they immediately need to come to nephrology, but certainly anyone with a rising creatinine, the question is, do you admit them or do you get, send them to nephrology? That would probably be the only urgent indication or if there's a severe electrolyte abnormality. But again, those folks are often going to be sent to the hospital um, because if, if it's that bad, and um, I, one of the things I just want to bring up is some of the sort of interventions we have now that are sort of new on the map and, and may change how we, we manage these patients. Um, just a background, this is, this is an old slide, but because it only goes up to 2011, but there's been this significant increase in patients requiring, uh, you know, have, have CKD um, or those requiring dialysis. And um, this is, ongoing um, and, and in it, to a large extent, this is related to the aging of our population. So if we look at these sort of oldest age groups over here, uh, that's where we're seeing most of this rise. And, and I've spoken about this in previous lectures, um, but this, I, the problem, not problem, the reason why we're seeing this is that uh, people are outliving their other conditions now. So if you've got coronary artery disease or cancer, uh, you're living longer and your comorbidities are there longer and, and we're seeing a lot more kidney disease um, over time. Um, I don't need to necessarily, I'm preaching to the choir on this, but you know, when I do think about kidney disease, I think about the different eras of, um, of uh, antiretroviral therapy and we, we have this sort of pre-heart and this is really where we're seeing all these HIV nephropathy patients. And I'll very briefly touch on that today. I think we've moved away from that in our current care. We see it, we need to know about it, but um, not what's, what's keeping us busy. Uh, and then in the antiretroviral era, um, there was this early era with drugs that were very toxic, not necessarily to the kidneys. Then we go through the tenofovir diciproxyl fumarate era where we're worried about the effects of drugs on kidneys in addition to drugs like adazanavir and, and back here would be Crixivan. Um, and, and now we're in that TAF era, and we'll talk about what should we be doing with TAF versus TDF is there. And, and I think some of these questions are unanswered. Um, I think we don't know for sure, but I'll give you my, what, what, what my thoughts are. Um, 
just to point out, you know, if, if we look at, and I, I did this for another talk and I have an update, but I really think it's pretty much the same, but I think this illustrates where we are um, with regards to the um, care of HIV patients in the nephrology clinic. Um, I just went back and looked at individual patients that were seen and looked at their demographics. And, and they're very, very different from what I would have seen 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, and you guys can attest to that as well. I don't think this is, is, is necessarily new to you. But the point is here that our patients are, are older than they used to be. Um, and the average age, if I was to say today, is probably two years later. They're now 60 years old, right? Because they're not dying. Um, they're just living longer and living to a normal age or close to a normal age. Um, the duration of HIV is its incredible, right? Those of us who are old enough um, have seen this all in front of our eyes. And um, I, I have many patients who have had HIV even for 30 years now. Um, you can see here, one patient's had HIV for 36 years. And if we look at the distribution on this graph, um, you know, all these folks here are, are more than 20 years of, of having had HIV. So we're seeing a, a patient population and obviously the folks down here have all these old exposures, old drugs, um, but they're just living long enough to get all the other diseases that, you know, I've diagnosed myeloma in the clinic. Um, you know, they, they're not dying from, from HIV anymore, but they're, they're getting kidney disease um, because they have other things, you know, they're, they're smokers. We have folks who have been injection drug users, um, a lot of diabetes, a lot of hypertension, um, all these significant risk factors having potentially genetic uh, predisposition and and therefore we just see a ton of chronic kidney disease in this population um, and if you see the breakdown most of what i'm seeing is stage three four and five um, i also see folks with nephrolithiasis gastric bypass patients. i'm bringing that up because you know these folks are at risk for oxalate nephropathy and oxalate kidney stones um, and should never be given vitamin c by the way because of that risk uh, we have folks with cancers, and, and then you can see out of 58, only 17 have been biopsied and only one high van. Um, and then this FSGS is, is really much more common, and that's your sort of genetic predisposition in this patient population. Um, we do, stu, do, do, still do see um, acute kidney disease. I, I, I differentiate it from acute kidney injury because acute kidney injury in, in, the, in the nephrology literature is actually what happens when you're in the hospital. Um, and so these are the folks who have rising creatinines and maybe it's not happening in seven days. Um, but when you see someone with a relatively acute or subacute change in creatinine, um, these are the things I'm thinking of, those directly rate HIV and those indirectly. Um, and to be honest, like we can pretty much take these off the list now because we're not necessarily seeing folks on TDF. Indinavir is gone. Um, and Anazanavir, at least I don't see anyone. I think I saw one patient like last year and I was like, why is this patient still on Anazanavir? I'm like, well, because I've been on this for 15 years and I like it. But generally, these are not issues. And, and I would say even HIV related diseases are not common. But we do have patients uh, in our clinic and that get admitted to the hospital who have very high viral loads. And so I would still keep these on the differential in those that have, have those very high viral loads. So how do I approach these patients? I really nowadays focus on those non-HIV causes, right? They're, they've got diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, um, myeloma, cancer, you know, the things that have really nothing to do with HIV are gonna be way, way more common um, in the current era. And, and then I'd still wanna go through those things that I would think are HIV related. Um, and, and high van would be the one. And just, I used to give like half my lecture on high van. I have one slide um, because I, I don't think that is what you guys are going to be seeing. And I, but you need to know when to think about it. And basically, um, when do I think about HIV nephropathy? Um, rapid rising creatinine, um, significant proteinuria, detectable viremia. In the, if any of those three is absent, I can almost guarantee you it's not going to be HIV associated nephropathy. Um, race is extremely important because the APOL1 risk alleles are thought to underlie that risk and we don't yet know, but there are some very interesting studies that are starting to determine the risk of APOL1 and they, they actually are now drug interventions where this gene is being interfered with 
and may actually uh, be helpful in in in, this, in in not just a high band, but really in in, in the in, uh, all African American patients who have that that risk. Um, you can really only make this diagnosis with, with, with a kidney biopsy, and there is a big differential diagnosis. And the most important thing is if you think someone is high van, you get them on antiretrovirals um, immediately. And, and I think that we do that now. You know, the, the, there wasn't necessarily a comfort with that 20 years ago, but um, I've seen patients being started on antiretrovirals the two days after they show up in the hospital, which is, is nice to see. Um, all the diagnoses here in blue can present with a similar presentation. This is up to 2007, and you can see that high van was, was the most common. Um, and if we look at more recent biopsy databases, this is from New York. Um, most common in their database was immune complex GNs, things like IgA nephropathy would probably be common in that list, or lupus, those type of diseases, diabetes. Um, FSGS is actually the most common in our patient population now. Um, and that's probably got to do with demographics. And you can see high van is, is third. And I would say that, that it's getting lower and lower on the list. And you're not going to see it that often, except in your patients that are either new presentation with high viral loads or in patients where they're not taking their meds or, or, or resistant to their medications. So with that background, um, because my lectures used to be on all that stuff, and I'll talk about Tenopia, which is still a little bit on that, but um, you know, I just think that's not where the focus should be. And, and actually the cases that, that Eileen was going to present to me are pretty much like this one um, and, and cover the, 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 the more common issues. And so um, patients I'm seeing in my clinic show up with elevated creatinines and um, sometimes they're quite chronic and sometimes they're a little more acute. Um, but this would be maybe a typical patient that many of you are now seeing, a 45-year-old who had, um, and by the way, anyone, feel free to interrupt me. Um, or, or send a chat. I see there's some chats in there. If, um, okay, PDF may be coming back. Um, so patient had diabetes for four years at least that we know of. Um, hypertension on two medications, um, which is being controlled. He's on a TDF-based regimen uh, till six years for six years and then changed to a back of your uh, 3TC dolotegavir. So Triumac three years ago because the creatinine had increased and the patient is referred to me because they have a creatinine of 2.2 milligrams per deciliter and that's been unchanged for six months. So likely uh, chronic kidney disease, if it's not changed in six months, or I'm sure is. Um, the question is, do we need to do anything more? Are there diseases that might behave this, this way that I need to be dealing with? And so what else might you be interested in the history? And if people want to throw things in the chat, um, Kelly asked, what is the hemoglobin A1C? Um, I'll show you that on the next slide, but it was relatively normal. Uh, cystatin C, um, well, that's also a good question because um, the patient's on dolotegravir and, and there may be some interference with creatinine secretion. And I think in this case, a cystatin C is very helpful and we'll, we'll address that as well. Um, and, and I think these are both appropriate tests that I would want to know about. Anything else in the history? Yeah, I'd want to know about over-the-counter medications, um, you know, non-steroidals. I would definitely ask about uh, proton pump inhibitors. And uh, those are really the two classes I want to know, non-steroidals. And you have to ask them brands because uh, I find a lot of times, say, you don't want to say you're non-steroid, but you say, oh, you take a lot of Motrin or, or Advil. No, but you take uh, ibuprofen. Oh, yeah, that, that, that I've been taking a lot of. Um, and then obviously proton pump inhibitors um, would be something that are becoming more, more frequently recognized as causes, certainly for chronic kidney disease. Um, and then a urine protein is going to be extremely important because that's going to categorize this as being either glomerular or being uh, tubular or both, right? The, the, there's a lot of overlap and, and sometimes it's, it's hard to know. So those type of, th those are the exact things that, that were ordered and um, here's some of the other things I want to know if you have a diabetic patient. I'm going to come back to this because I think there's, there's one of the questions that comes up a lot is I have a diabetic patient in front of me. When should I worry? Like, do I just say it's diabetes? Um, and, and I've got another case where we'll address that. But in this case, there's no retinopathy, no chronic non-steroidal PPI use, no OTC meds. 
Uh, family history is really important, particularly in, in, uh, in our patients um, because of genetic predisposition. And I always get really, really worried when someone tells me that they have a sibling on dialysis or, or other family members because it alerts me to the possibility of APOL1. And, and those tend to be, I wouldn't say relentless, but once they've got CKD, there does tend to be progression. We can do things to slow that down. We'll talk about that. Um, hemoglobin A1C, I would say, is well controlled. Um, you know, keep in mind that as people get CKD, their diabetes controls better because insulin sticks around longer. And, and frequently I'll biopsy a patient and say, oh, you've got diabetic, diabetic kidney disease. And they go, but my diabetes is great. And I'm saying, yeah, now it is, but how about 10 years ago? And they say, no, not so good then. And the reason it's well controlled is not because we're doing a better job sometimes. It's just the insulin sticks around longer because it's cleared by the kidneys. Uh, cystatin C was obtained here. Remember, creatinine was 2.2, cystatin C 1.5, and uh, microalbumin of 180. So that's not normal, right? It, we often like say, oh, whatever, it's microalbumin. It's, it's more than 30. There's something wrong with this patient, and, and I'll show you what this microalbumin might mean for this patient um, as, as a pro prognostic indicator. And, and then the negative serologic workup. So um, the type of things that may make me think there's something more than the fact that he had been on TDF for a long time and has diabetes and, um, you know, may have had other exposures. You know, do I need to biopsy this patient is the question. So patients like this, I might nod. It's chronic. The LV proteinuria is not that significant. That makes me think they've got a glomerular disease. Uh, this is mostly like, you know, tubular interstitial process and, um, I'd probably monitor this patient and see what, what happens over time and try and modify their, their CKD risk factors. So question number one, does this patient have CKD? Um, and uh, I think most of you would agree that they do. What, what's their prognosis? Um, would you guys say that this patient has a great prognosis, that creatinine has been stable for two years, moderate prognosis? Um, do you, are you worried about this patient? And, and then how do we manage them? Is there, is there anything you can do for a patient like this? Um, that, uh, so someone said there, Eileen said she's worried. Um, yeah, I, I'd be worried about this patient. The question is what's worrying you more, the creatinine or the, the albuminuria? Well, I'm always worried, but I'm guessing based on what you said that I should be more worried about the albuminuria. Yeah, I think they, they both are very important, but but um, the albuminuria may be a better prognostic indicator of where are we going to go forward. Um, and I'll show you how that factors in. So you all know the the, the, the markers of, of renal function. Uh, just want to point out that the uh, CKD epi formula has has now changed and, and no longer um, in, in, has a race variable. And there's been a lot of um, discussion regarding this thing. There might have been a medical grand rounds, um, a lot of editorials. And um, I think the feeling was that that race did not belong in this equation and that it biased um, our interpretation of patients' risk. And it was removed. And CKD Epi 2021 is now, if you look in, in Epic, you've got probably a bunch of emails about this. Um, there's a GFR now that's reported that is not race-based. It is based on this new formula. Turns out it's going to be somewhere between what the African-American patient GFR was with the old formula and the non-African-American. So it's pretty much a number in the middle. And that brings in some of its own biases. But I think that at the end of the day, once a patient has CKD, it's not that far off what, they, what, what we think their true GFR is. Or So... Well, I think that it's it's appropriate to be using this this formula for all your calculations moving forward, um, and that's what if if you weren't aware of it, you will start seeing it. And it is now in Epic as of January thirty first um, that there's a, 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 a G, an estimated GFR based on on this formula. Obviously, we have glomerular injury markers, proteinuria, and albuminuria, and then renal tubulin markers. We can br briefly touch on when discussing tenofovir. Um, sorry. So just to point out the, the GFR calculator, if, if, if you want to calculate GFR, 
Um, it, it will show up in EPIC. You can just use that GFR based on creatinine, but there is a calculator. I usually use the one from the National Kidney Foundation where you can enter cystatin C and creatinine, and it'll give you the, the, the breakup of whether it's creatinine, you know, with the creatinine cystatin C um, based on the patient's age and gender. And, and here is, is the patient that I present. And you can see that the creatinine based number is 37, the cystatin C is 48. Um, in the non HIV population, it, it, it's felt that this equation is actually the, the most accurate. Um, the problem with HIV is that there's this creatinine secretion issue from the, the, the integrase inhibitors and cobacystat. And so it's not clear that maybe. Cystatin C would be a better measure in this population. Certainly the number is probably not your creatinine. It's somewhere in between these two. And it can at least reassure you uh, that the GFR may be a little bit higher. So based on this, does the patient have CKD? Um, clearly they do, um, but there is a definition, right? CKD requires three months, needs a GFR of less than 60, um, and needs a, or, uh, an ACR greater than 30. It, uh, you can have normal creatinine with an ACR more than 30 and you are considered a chronic kidney disease. Um, what's tricky sometimes is someone might have a GFR of 65, but they started at 90 and they don't have proteinuria. They certainly have kidney disease. Um, it may not exactly fulfill the criteria for, for CKD based on, on what I'm presenting here. And then the question here is, is dolutegravir contributing to CKD? And I don't know if anyone has any opinions. Um, you know, would you try to get them off dolutegravir if you're seeing these numbers? Um, do you just say, oh yeah, it drops your GFR and I'm, I'm not worried. Could it be playing any role? And, and those are questions I will sometimes get. I think there is still a little bit of a, a misunderstanding in, related to to this this question i don't see any comments but um, okay in general if i feel like it's a secretion inhibition i'll continue to use the dolutegravir in that setting and not think of it so much as a toxicity as a, a artifact right. but hopefully i'm not wrong no i think that's correct um and i have seen people stop dolutegravir because they worried about the cranium being high and I don't think that's necessary. Now, it sometimes fuzzies the picture a little bit, right? And it get, you know, you're just not sure what to make of it. But so, you know, do other drugs. And um, I would say if the patient's doing well and they're tolerating the drug and their creatinine is stable, uh, then you can keep the keep the drug going and just be aware that their GFR is probably a little bit higher, like in this case, than it than it's showing on on this. Now, what's tricky is if if the GFR is showing it, you know. 45 on your on this equation and 55 here, and you have to dose a medication. What are you going to do? And I would say you probably choose a number in the middle, um, and and you can be fairly confident that it's going to be somewhere around there or closer to cystatin C. And can I just check on like sort of the assumptions about the secretion based, you know, using trimethoprim as the the case that you know for, more from residency would be like a approximately. 10% or less increase that occurs rapidly after initiation of the drug and then remains stable over time. So likewise for dolutegravir patients who've been on it for six months and then have a rise, I typically wouldn't attribute yeah, it there. Yeah, it, it should happen right away um, and then should stabilize. So if three months later, the creatinine is rising. I'm going to worry about a new process. Now, again, the GFR may not be what we think it is, but that's your chronic process. Um, but acutely, you would expect the GFR to, the, the creatinine to rise and then level off. If it doesn't level off, then I'm worried that maybe they've got an interstitial nephritis or some other effect of your newly started regimen. Um, but it, it would level off if it's dolutegravir. Um, and as you probably all know, the reason is that dolutegravir in, in, interferes with creatinine transport in this, this tubule as does cobacystat. I forget where trimethoprim works. Um, generally, you're not going to see it with your, the usual doses of, of Bactrim that you're using. Um, you know, certainly if you're using prophylactic Bactrim, you will not see a creatinine effect. If you're using 
Um, the standard dosing, you shouldn't, but I'll tell you that what happens is Bactrim is one of those drugs that tends to be used at higher doses than it should be. So patients will have CKD and folks are using BID dosing. And, and so then you see the hyperkalemia and the hyponatremia and, and, and the, the creatinine rise. Um, but, but is through a similar mechanism, Rupivirine is thought to do this as well. Uh, Bictegravir is thought to do this as well. A cimetidine would be another drug um, that could do this. And, and even metformin has been um, reported uh, to us. Yeah, and, and PCP dosing is not an issue. I do want to make a point about PCP dosing. It's, it's one of my like things I get on a soapbox with a house staff and I'll get on the soapbox and you can be, I've heard this before, like, please stop it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I get very distressed when people won't use Bactrim in people just because they have CKD. Um, and, and what I, I think happens in, in, in people's brains, and it's, it's at least my brain, I have limited space at my age and things sit in file folders like my wife's name and my sister's name for some reason sit in the same file folder because when they're together i call, call them by the names but people put bactrim in the same file folder at least as my impression as non-steroidals like it's somewhere in the same part of your brain and i want to put them in different parts of your brain in that bactrim is not a nephrotoxin um it it, it doesn't it's not nephrotoxic any more than another antibiotic may cause interstitial nephritis. It needs to be appropriately dosed, but it should. It can absolutely be used in CKD. And, and it is so common that I have patients, um, particularly in, in my lupus world, where they're put on Dapsone and Atovaquone um, because someone won't use it because they have CKD. And we know that Bactrim is the best drug and, and we're depriving our patients of optimal care when we're thinking of it as being a nephrotoxin. So if, if you haven't heard that from me before, or, or you know this already, I apologize. But I, I just see it happening so often where people aren't getting on Bactrim and then, you know, Tovacoin stinks and it's expensive and Dapsone doesn't work as well. Um, so I'll make a point because this made me think about it. So I digress, but it, it is something that, that happens a lot and want to make sure that that myth is dispelled. So this was what we we're saying about using dolotegravir and COVID test. That big tegravir is, is you, you can recheck the cranny in five to seven days. Um, I don't think you have to recheck it. You could recheck it when they come back to clinic. Um, but if it's higher, um, you can recheck it to make sure it didn't go any higher. The, the numbers that I've heard is somewhere from five to 20% GFR decrease. Um, and, and I think why that is, is that as particularly in CKD patients, because what happens is as your GFR declines, um, you the creatinine secretion component contributes more to creatinine excretion than, than it normally would. And so when you give people this drug who have CKD, you see much bigger increases in, in their, their, their creatinine versus someone who's got normal kidney function, their cranny is 0.6, it will go to 0.7, but they're at 1.4, they're gonna to go to two. So people get much more distressed in their CKD patients because you, you definitely see these changes uh, much more often and they look much worse. And it's only got to do with how creatinine is secreted in those patients. Um, so statin C um, can be checked to help you decide like what's really going on here. And this addresses one of the questions is, how often should I check a cystatin C? Um, my view is in general, you can check it once. Um, I do see some folks checking it frequently, very expensive still. Um, and once you've sort of got your sense of its relationship to creatinine, they 95 plus, plus percent of the time, they're gonna change in parallel. And so you really don't need a screen cystatin C. If your cranium is going up, almost always the, the, the cystatin C is gonna go up as well. Um, if it's a GFR related issue. So I don't think you need to check it more than that one time just to establish where you are, um, because I don't think it gives you that much more information and it, it is much more costly uh, to use the statin C. Albuminuria here are ranges in the nephrology world. We're using the word moderate albuminuria, which makes this sound much worse, but actually it is much worse um, than microalbuminuria. It kind of, I think, is a little euphemistic. Um, and, you know, people with albuminuria in this range do have significant cardiovascular risk factors are huge, probably more than having a high LDL cholesterol. 
Um, and then prognostically, if they have CKD, uh, it is a big issue. Um, here's a heat map of, of how we look at our GFR versus our albuminuria. And, and here are different ranges. Remember, we're starting to look at stage three CKD differently for B and A, because B, as you can see, is, is much, much higher risk than, than having A. And here's where the albuminuria comes in. Um, is You can see that someone with um, normal GFR, but albuminuria is at the uh, same risk as someone who's got a compromised GFR and no albuminuria. So a big contributor um, to this, this concern for progression of kidney disease. And the heat map, by the way, for cardiovascular death, for you, you name it, looks exactly like this. It, um, you could change, and you can change this for whatever you want. It, it looks exactly the same. So um, what is the risk? And I'm not sure if, if you all are, are aware of the kidney failure risk equation. Um, it is, is very, very well validated in very large populations. And it tells us what is the patient's two-year and five-year risk of needing dialysis. And it puts them then in a category that you can understand a little bit better. And so you can go online um, and get it, or it just became a dot phrase. Um, we have other things in nephrology that you guys can't get to on the, on the storyboard, but um, if you just type in dot KFRE, I'll show you um, what, what information you'll get, um, but basically involves the patient's age, gender, where they live, um, their albuminuria, and their GFR. And then on the online, you get this little fancy looking report. Um, if you do .kfre in EPIC, you'll get these two numbers, um, and they will give you a sense of how's this patient going to do. So this patient um, has a two-year risk of needing dice, 2.2% 2 .2 at two years and a 7% at five-year risk of being on dialysis. Now, what's driving this is, is actually albumin much more than anything else. Um, if I took this and made it 500, this number would change much more dramatically than if I took the GFR and made it 35. Um, so both are playing a significant role in what gives me this number, but the albuminuria um, really drives my long-term prognosis. So when I have someone with like no albumin in their urine and a creatinine of 1.5, they're probably going to do just fine long-term. And when you put their numbers in here, they come back at 1% and uh, th these folks are going to do well. So if you haven't seen this kidney failure risk, you might see the nephrologist putting that in their notes. I, I'm sometimes careful with putting my notes because the patients are reading the notes and they're like, what? Th there's another one, which is mortality risk. There's another equation and that's a pretty scary one. And I definitely never put that information in my notes, but I, I, I know in the back of my mind what that might be in my CKD patients. But um, you know, I share this with my patients. I had a patient yesterday, I told you the 30% five-year risk of being on dialysis. And, and for her, that was way better than she thought. Because I first assessed what she thought her risk was. And they said, hey, it's much lower. And she kind of saw that as being a 65% chance that she won't be on dialysis. And she thought that was pretty good odds. Um, so how you share that information um, is important. And then also, th there are some rules in the nephrology rules to like, when would you want to send a patient to a nephrologist based on these? Um, and so what they're saying is, you know, if you have a, you know, 5% risk over five years, um, that's, that's a reasonable reason to send them to a nephrologist. 10% over two years, uh, they should see it, it, you know, they should start being thought about as someone who's going to progress and should start, you know, get really comprehensive nephrology care. Um, and if it's a 20 to 40% over two years, those folks should really be planned for dialysis and transplant. So this gives you those. And I think those are reasonable guidelines if you're trying to figure out what should I do with these patients. Before you move on from that, those you covered my questions, which was partially like how do patients respond to this, but just to highlight their I think I caught that you said around 20 to 40% would be dialysis preparation and also transplant referral. Yeah. So, so, okay, on so this, those are, that's number. the range. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, and um, th those folks are almost guaranteed to progress. Um, and, you know, if, if they're GFR, the, 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 the transplant clinic, for example, will see patients with a GFR of less than 30. Um, 
I'm not going to send someone the GFR less than 30 if this if this number is 7%, but if it's this 20 to 40 percent, I'll send them because what can happen is they can get all the evaluation done and they're going to get to 20 in a year, and then they can immediately get on the list and start building up time. And, and so you can sort of preempt them getting on the list as well. Um, and, and this is sort of a number that they they may not even see someone with a GFR of 25 if, if this number is low. Um, but if it's high, they'll say, yeah, this patient will get less than 20 in the not too distant future, let's get them ready for a transplant. So how do we reduce the risk in these folks? Um, this is a, a list of things we can do. Some we can control, some we can't. Um, I can't make you younger, unfortunately, but I can encourage you to lose weight. I say encourage because we know how challenging this. I was recently told that there's a weight gain epidemic with some of these newer drugs in the, in the HIV clinic. I'd love to come to one of those lectures because I, I feel like I'm seeing it in front of my eyes. With some of my patients, they just keep expanding and I, I, I don't know what to do about it, but it is a massive problem. So I didn't mean that, no pun intended. It, 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 it's a large problem um, in, in our CKD patients. You know, we really do see um, improvement with, with significant weight loss in long-term outcomes. Um, um, but it's got to be significant weight loss, but it helps all these other things, right? It helps my blood pressure controls, my diabetes control, my lipid management. Um, and so, you know, I think this is a, a really um, important issue. And one of the things that's probably most relevant for you and, and partially to Joko's point, initially this was thought to be integrase driven, um, but and over the last year, there was at least one, IAS meeting where TAF was implicated in a lot of the weight gain. And the message from over the last year has been that it's possible that actually TDF is weight suppressive as right. opposed to, and so there may be more introduction back of, of different forms of tenofovir over time. And, and but the jury is still out on, on most of those questions. Yeah, it's because I brought this up with Christy in the clinic. I said, I don't know what's going on, but wow, like seeing people they're all gaining weight and, and she brought that out and like, okay, I guess I'm out of the loop these days. So I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear what, what the plans are for, for that issue. Um, you know, as far as blood pressure, keep in mind, we have um, some animation on here. Um, you know, these categories of blood pressure and, and really normal is now considered less than 120 over 80. This elevated blood pressure, you don't necessarily have to treat, but I would certainly try and intervene. Um, high blood pressure, the guidelines would say you can do behavior modification, diet modification, weight loss, and, and some of these things before treating, and certainly above 140, you're going to treat those folks. Um, certainly, if someone has chronic kidney disease, uh, I would try and treat someone who's got a, um, a blood pressure in this range or who has albuminuria, uh, but try and intervene on some of these sort of nonspecific interventions. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, we'll talk about in a minute, treating acidosis, uh, you know, you guys are going to go look at my notes and go, you don't do that. So yeah, I'm starting to, um, I think the jury has been out for a while, but I think that more and more, there's more and more of a push to actually treat acidosis. And uh, this is a very nice review of this particular issue. And I just took this graph out. And basically what this is saying is, is there's, there's growing evidence that keeping someone's bicarb um, above 22 has benefits for sure with regard to bone and, and, and mortality risk. And then keeping it maybe in the 24 to 26 range may actually slow progression of chronic kidney disease. Now we don't want to go high, but this might be something that, that we're going to start focusing on. And I think what you're going to see, there, there might be a big push and you talk about pharmaceutical industry, just pushing things. There's a drug that's in the works that doesn't it, give you a sodium load, right? So one of the problems we have with the sodium bicarb and with bicitra is you're giving these patients a sodium load and we're trying to control their blood pressure. We're trying to control their edema um, and we don't really want to give them more sodium. And so we say, ah, you know, they live between 20 and 22. I, I, I'm going to deal with it. Um, but there's a drug that's being, I don't think it's FDA approved yet, but it will, when it is, you, it's going to be pushed really, really hard. And suddenly you're going to start seeing lots of publications on this because they're going to want you to use their drug that doesn't have sodium um, load, but, in, but improves acidosis. And there's some good, good data on that drug showing some improved outcomes. 
So this might become an issue that you're going to be hearing because someone's going to be making a lot of money out of correcting bicarbonates. Um, but from a medical standpoint, the, the growing evidence would be that we probably should be keeping that bicarb above 22. So I'm going to move on to the next case. Um, and and if, if I run out of time at the end, I'll just very briefly touch on the TAF issue. But I'm not going to go into the, the toxicities. Um, but I think this is something that comes up a little bit more now than, than TAF and TDF. But uh, this would be a, a diabetic patient who's, who's clearly got diabetic complications of retinopathy and neuropathy. And she presents um, with a creatinine that, that is increased. So baseline 250 milligrams albuminuria, creatinine 1.3 um, on Bictarvi. And um, she now comes in with edema and proteinuria that's increased massively and a creatinine that's gone up a little bit. And then you, know, you, you see that and you go, how worried should I be about that? And you're probably gonna refer a patient whose proteinuria does this, I would say you should refer them to nephrology. Well, what if it went from 250 to 350? You may not. Um, and, and we'll talk about when would you worry about this being an issue? Uh, this person's disease is, uh, if the diabetes is not well controlled, HIV is. And um, other than a low sodium diet, you know, these are the type of things you might be thinking about. You know, should I do a serologic workup and then call nephrology if anything's positive? Should I refer this patient to nephrology? Should I increase their ACE inhibitor? Um, you know, they, they've got room to move there. Should I start an SGLT2 inhibitor? Um, stop the big that, that was another question that came up. Um, but you can see that you're probably gonna do more than one of these and maybe not in, all at once. And so these are all bad questions because you, you're gonna probably do one thing at a time. Um, I would recommend certainly referring to nephrology, but I would hope you would at least have a framework within which you're going to do that. And, and, and that will bring up the next few slides is when do I worry about a diabetic patient? Um, and and I, I, I've always loved this graph. There's another one that I, that I had like 20 years ago and I lost it that I really liked because it also had blood pressure on here. And basically, if you want to put blood pressure on here, it does that. Okay. And, and then people get concerned about all three things happening at once. But the idea here is that the natural history of diabetes is, you know, at first you might actually have a creatinine that goes down a little bit. Um, and then you start to see this relentless decline in, in, in GFR. But at the same time, you have this surge in proteinuria. And, and what happens is that I don't see patients over here. You know, creatinine is 1.4. Wasn't recognized that it really started at 0.8. So you've lost 40% of GFR already. But, you know, 1.4 doesn't get us too uptight. It's not that high above normal. And the proteinuria maybe is in that, you know, that microalbuminuria range still. And then what happens is there's a sudden change and, and, and the patient's on this, this part and the proteinuria is going up and the GFR is dropping. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's often panic. Um, and the question is, well, it's appropriate panic because it could really be there's another disease, right? We don't know that this, this is not a, a lupus or a vasculitis or, or, or some other disease, but keep in mind that the natural history is that that, that is often the sudden change um, and, and therefore, if you can intervene back here, you, you're way better off because once this is, once you're over here, um, the, the options become much more limited and response to therapy um, is, is, is much less. So just to keep that, that graph in mind, um, when you think about your diabetic patient and, and how once they've got some albuminuria and some decrease in GFR, um, that's part of the natural history, but it could also be that the sudden changes are part of their natural history. And so when do I actually think about, when should I refer a diabetic patient to nephrology? Like when do I think, wait a minute, this is not their diabetes or probably half the time it still is, or even more than that. But now they, we start to see patients where it's not their diabetes, right? And, and the things that are gonna make me think that are if the rapid decline in GFR, the sudden worsening in proteinuria, um, proteinuria that is early in their diagnosis, um, an active sediment. So if they have hematuria, I'll tell you that 80% of the time I've obviously someone with hematuria, they have diabetic nephropathy, but 20% they don't. And that 20% um, were, were unmasked really by the hematuria. And I'd still want to know who that 20% is. So just because most of them still going to be diabetic nephropathy, 
doesn't mean this patient shouldn't get an evaluation. If they have no retinopathy, I get pretty concerned um, because almost universally you have the two together. Um, certainly if you have retinopathy, you will definitely have nephropathy. The other way around is not always entirely true. And, and then any sign of systemic disease or serologic evidence of disease. So, you know, if all these things are, are not too concerning, you know, but you've done an SPEP and a UPEP and those are showing a monoclonal gammopathy, that would be enough to consider a kidney biopsy or a referral to nephrology. And th this is sort of the outline, it's kind of busy, um, but you're gonna do your usual renal evaluation. And um, I'm a big fan of, of these, S certainly if there's, if there's zero proteinuria, you probably don't have to do that. You're unlikely to find related diseases. Um, but in our aging population, this, this is the one that's gonna you know, catch us off guard and you know, any monoclonal gammopathy does not have to be myeloma. You know, it's just any monoclonal light chain presence can cause a number of different kidney diseases um, that is outside of, of, of this lecture. Now, if your patient has typical feature of diabetic nephropathy, they don't need a biopsy. Um, and if, you know, if there hasn't been much progression, much change, you probably don't even need to send them to nephrology unless you feel like you're not comfortable sort of getting on top of their chronic kidney disease. And, and, and that would be a perfect evaluation. I'll talk about that in a second as to what we're doing these days. And then obviously, if they have any of those features, you really want to get them to nephrology sooner rather than later. Look like someone might have had a question. Okay, well, very briefly, SGLT2 inhibitors, because I don't have time, I'm not going to go through mechanism, but what I tell my patients, it takes the stress off the kidney. Why does it take this? How does it do that? It decreases filtration. Well, if you decrease filtration, you're also going to make the creatinine go up. So this is another drug that's going to make my creatinine up. In this case, it is a reduction in GFR. Um, and, and I'll show you some of the data. The number of studies, um, cardi cardiac and renal. So all your heart failure patients are probably being put on Jardians now, um, especially if it's, if it's um, with low ejection fraction. Um, and, and really all your CKD patients with and without diabetes based on, on these studies. The, the initial trials in kidney disease were in diabetic patients and placebo, this is, you know, the events, um, in, you know, end-stage renal disease, doubling of creatinine, uh, much worse in placebo than with um, canagliflozin. And you can see the same thing um, with these composite outcomes. But the thing that I want to point out is what happens to your GFR when you start these drugs. There's a significant decline initially, and then they kind of level off. And then your placebo group continues to decline and you get more and more benefit over time uh, by having a patient on these drugs. And the drug that really changed, the study that really changed what we do from a chronic kidney disease standpoint is the DAPA CKD. And in this study, there were a number of non-diabetics, 33%, and it was very, very clear that these drugs worked in di non-diabetics as well and, and had the same type of results when it came to progression and again, um, there's this notable drop in, in GFR, um, really up to, you know, you can see a 10% drop, um, sometimes even more than that um, in GFR. This is least square mean change in estimated GFR. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I haven't got my head around that, but bottom line, you can see, you know, a 10, 15% drop in GFR sometimes, which is why if you're using in people low GFRs, you might get them into trouble um, when you're using these drugs. And you know, the, the, basically every subgroup, the, there was benefit of using dapagliflozin. And so the use of SGLT2 inhibitors has become standard of care now in your CKD patients. Um, and when you do prescribe them, um, the, the, the insurance companies say, well, the GFR is less than 25. You shouldn't use them, to be honest. They probably will work in GFR less than 25. But if you're at 25 and I drop you to 15, I'm going to cause other problems, and I'm seeing that in some of my patients. Um, so you really have to monitor their, their, their GFR. And if you see the creatinine bump, don't be alarmed. It's like starting an ACE inhibitor. Creatinine can bump a little and then level off. That actually tells me the drug's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and But you do expect to see some rise in creatinine. Gets everyone, gets the, the patients very, uh, those who keep up with what's going on, gets them alarmed. But, I generally anticipate that and explain to them their cranium may go up. Um, and um, there is not clear data on non-albuminuric CKD um, as to when 
uh, whether you should use these drugs. Um, the, the things that I discuss with patients, the main risks are if they have UTIs, they're going to be more severe. And then um, yeast infections are, are increases because you have sugar coming out and the sugar's feeding whatever's there. Um, this euglycemic ketoacidosis, I don't know how to, you know, basically the patients start feeling really sick and they have a metabolic acidosis with an anion gap. Um, so, but I, I just tell patients, if you feel sick, get seen by your doctor and labs will reveal whether they have this. And then volume depletion, because it does make them polyuric. And so occasionally you might see that in someone who's not taking enough. But these are the things that I tell patients, as long as they aren't having UTIs and they don't get yeast infections frequently, um, I'm, I'm quite comfortable using these drugs. Now, because I'm running out of time, I do want to point out in diabetic nephropathy, there are other drugs. There's finerenone, which is FDA approved. I'm not sure what to do yet. Do I add it on to SGLT2 inhibitors? That hasn't been established. I'm sort of waiting for some guidelines. I've done it once. Not sure what the right thing is. I usually start with an SGLT2 inhibitor. And those of you who are interested in the GLP receptor agonist, this is a really nice paper that goes through like, which one should I use when? Bottom line is if you have a low GFR, you're going to use a GLP-1A. If you have a GFR above 30, use an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, in those with chronic kidney disease, but they, they have a whole algorithm here that I think there's just no time for that. So I'm just going to skip right away the, to, to TAF because I think you guys all know the story. Um, I do want to point this out because I think this might answer one of the questions. Um, so obviously we know TDF is nephrotoxic. Um, TAF does not appear to be such and certainly using, you know, above a GFR of 50 is, is certainly absolutely fine. The 30 to 50 range, there's, there's certainly data suggesting it's okay. Below 30 GFR, um, there, there really isn't much data and people do use the drug. Um, but here's one of the concerns, and that is that as the GFR starts to drop, um, even this drug, the levels start to go up. So here's the TAF and you're measuring to tenofovir and, and you see the numbers go up and look what happens when they're on dialysis. You, you're getting into this range that is where you would have with the, with um, a patient who's who's on TDF um, and has normal kidney function. TDF obviously in dialysis patient extremely high. Um, I'm not a fan using it with a GFR below 30. I think that you may well see enough accumulation that you could start seeing proximal tubulopathies. I think if you have someone who's already got proximal tubal disease, I would I would not use it right away. I would make sure that they've the proximal tubulopathy resolves, and then you can re-challenge um, because we don't know what happens in those patients. We have some patients who are TDF who the proximal tubulopathy has never gone away. I probably would not use TAF in that patient population. Um, and I do worry a little bit in my dialysis patient. I'll tell you why. There is very strong data that, that shows that um, Residual renal function is very important in, in both mortality and long-term outcomes of dialysis patients. And if I have someone who's still making a good amount of urine, if they're making no urine, no problem, less than you know, 100 or 200 cc's, doesn't matter. But if they're making, they're telling you, I still go to the bathroom three times a day and I'm making urine. I, I don't think we should be using these drugs, um, even TAF. There's enough accumulation here that it's probably not your ideal medication in someone who's on dialysis who still has good urine output. And in those folks, I would probably avoid TAF um, if possible. If they don't have any other options, you would deal with it. You know, if they have hep B that's out of control, we'll deal with it. But in general, I would not use in, in that population. Um, you said you said more than 100 to 200 cc's of urine a day. Would okay. Be, so we, we uh, I mean, not, not, to, not to be too specific. So I would but, say 250 cc's a day is you know, if they make more than 250 a day, those patients, at least in, in the models, seem to do better if you can keep their kidney function. 250, you know, if they 250 to 500, you might say well, it's really not that much. Um, but, you know, that's over two days or over a weekend, that's 750 cc's, that, that could be the difference between them, you know, getting volume overloaded or, or dropping their pressure on dialysis because I've got to take off too much. Um, and, and so that's where that, that, volume would come into play. Um, and, and so so the bottom line on, on, on TAF is I think it's fine with mild to moderate renal impairment. 
Um, but I think that in, in dialysis patients, you should dose adjust it. Um, I don't think you should be using it in GFRs less than 30. Um, and in dialysis patients who have residual renal function, um, probably not be a good idea. That, that's my opinion. I think there's some basis to it um, and supported by many, but I don't think we have enough data in GFRs less than 30, you know, about redosing and, you know, under, how do you actually dose these patients? And I think there are alternatives that should be adequately uh, usable to control patients' viral loads. So I'm over time and yeah, so I mean, I, I answered your questions. Um, I, that was fantastic. And I mean, I think I'm sure there are many more questions, but people can feel free to um, email them. Dr. Fine shared these slides. And I also took notes during the presentation with some of the super high yield sort of um, websites and some of the questions that come up a lot. And I'll post those also into the teams um, so people can find it there. But thank you so much, Dr. Fine, not only for this talk, but for all of the things that you do for our patients all the time. And um, this was really fantastic. Pleasure. And happy to take any questions if anyone has any. There are lots of things in the chat. You're Mostly welcome. telling you you're amazing, but <laughs> I'll summarize. I haven't seen any additional actual questions, but lots of thanks. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>